I want to start with a story that just happened. I don't have any slides for this because it literally, I closed on a flip, a uh, luxury flip. I signed at the hotel on Friday, Friday morning, two days ago, and it funds on Monday. And this is on the sale. So I, I bought this luxury house. I did this big renovation and sold it. And I don't know, anybody see, I put it on social media, my, my uh, yeah, it was 962, 922 and six cents was my net proceeds on this flip. And it's luxury, right? I sold it for 2.6 million. And how many of you think that's super impressive? Like, wow, look at Jerry Flex, he's amazing. Yeah. Right, that's pretty cool, right? I actually blew it, I actually blew the deal. I, I whiffed it bad, that deal. I should have made, I was hoping to make, I anticipated making, I went into the deal to make 1.6 and blew it and made 9.62. Who's, who feels really bad for me? <laughs> yeah, who feels really bad for me? Damn. Yeah, you screwed it up, Jerry. I got caught, uh, my rehab went over budget. I had a lot of problems with materials, overpaid, and it sold for less than I had hoped it would because I, timing was wrong, right? It, I just, just sold it now, market came down. And so I actually blew the deal and made a lot less. But I didn't really blow the deal, did I? Because I still made a lot of money. I did two things right with that deal. I did a lot of things wrong, I did two things right. I bought right, which I wanna talk to you about, and I had the right financing on the project, and that helped a lot. And so I wanna to talk to you though about how to really anticipate being way off on things. And I, I, Jamil talked about that a little bit as well. I talked about, you have no idea, we have no certainty that when you buy that property, you fix it up, you put it back up on the market four months, five months, six months later, or however long later, that you're gonna actually hit your ARVs, right? Your, your after repair value. And so how do we anticipate that and still be really successful at this business? So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. But first of all, I don't think we're gonna experience a crash, but definitely a correction. I wanna talk about this a little bit and I wanna talk about some of the fundamentals and then I wanna give you some really good action items for how to do this successfully in this market. Two reasons why I don't think the market is going to crash is first of all, we do not have enough supply to meet the demand. Everybody agree with me? There's not enough supply. Uh, right now we're gonna run into some real issues because the, the interest rates are gonna cause two problems. It's gonna make buyers reluctant to buy because who wants to buy in at a 7% interest rate or could be higher. And sellers aren't gonna wanna trade out, they're not gonna wanna list and sell to trade their 3% rate to a 6% or 7% rate, are they? So we're gonna run into this weird situation here where we're probably gonna continue to see an inventory problem. And the second reason I think that we're not gonna really see a crash is because of hedge funds. We didn't have hedge funds the last time around, really. And so when the CEO of Wells Fargo goes golfing with the CEO of Blackstone, and the CEO of Wells Fargo says, yeah, I got a thousand you know, non-performing assets on my books right now, what do you think the CEO of Blackstone's gonna say? I'll, I'll buy every one of those. And you and I never see them. They're not gonna hit the market. And, and these hedge funds are raising billions of dollars right now to anticipate maybe that happening, right? So, what crashes a market? A flood of foreclosures. So we're not going to see a crash, but we will see a correction. That's for certain. Pendings are down. Days on market are up. All the signs are that a correction is happening. And so the number one question I get with fix and flip is, is now a good time to flip? Should I not flip right now? The market's correcting. The market's coming down. Should I not flip? And when I hear that question, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what flipping is because as long as people live in houses, they're gonna buy and sell. They're gonna trade. And I don't think people are gonna stop living in houses no matter what the market does, right? You agree with me? The what flipping never changes. That's been happening since people started living in caves. Flipping is gonna continue to flip. Flipping is flipping is flipping. How we flip always changes. So we have to adapt. And the most successful flippers I know are very quick to adapt. They see the changes happening, they adjust quickly, and they keep flipping. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually really, really excited to flip right now. Who, who thinks they know why? Why would Jerry be excited to flip in a correcting market? Less competition. Less competition, meaning we can buy deeper, can't we? Yep. Who's excited to buy deeper right now? Oh my gosh. We've worked 10 times harder in the past two years to get good deals. I'm really excited to be able to buy deeper and have less work that goes into acquisitions. I mean, there's gonna be some deals coming out. Who's excited for some deals right now? Yeah. I'm really excited to get some deals and we're, so we're doubling down, we're buying more right now. 
that it's correcting because I can get deeper discounts. Let's take a second and talk a little bit about the market and, and what happens when it's a seller's market. The market's up. This is what we've experienced the last couple of years. And during that time, it's so easy to sell. Like if we can just get to that part of the game where we're selling, oh man, it's so fun, right? Because people want those deals and they're gonna pay. Over list price offers, multiple offers, it's been so fun in this business when you're on the selling side. Uh, what else has been easy in a seller's market? Funding. Funding, right? Money everywhere, cheap money. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would see single digit hard money rates. Are you kidding? When I started in 04 through, that, through the 07, 08 crash, I was paying 18% and eight points for money and happy to pay it. What's harder though, like you said, is buying. That's a seller's market. Now what happens when we shift to a buyer's market? Everything flip-flops, right? It's easy to buy. There's deals everywhere or easier to buy because there's more opportunity. But what gets harder? Selling gets harder. And what else gets harder? Yeah, so really what we're doing is we're just trading our hard and our easy. That's all. So what does that mean for you and me? We just adapt our focus. We just adapt where we put our attention. Okay, so there, we're in this weird transitional period right now today as of this conversation because what's happening now is cash buyers, they want bigger discounts right now, right? Because they see the correction, they're anticipating the correction, but they're seeing it at a faster rate than sellers are willing to come down on price. So sellers are kind of a little bit slower, right? They're reluctant, they're holding on to yesterday's value, they're still looking at that Zillow number, they're still looking at those comps from three months ago, and they're kind of holding out still a little bit. We're starting to see them come down, but there's a disconnect. And guess how I know there's a disconnect? I talked to a lot of wholesalers who are telling me that their contract termination rate is at like 50%. Meaning what? They lock up a deal, they think they, got, they think they know the numbers, they think it's a deal, they take it to their cash buyers and their cash buyers say what? No, no not a deal. Oh crap, gotta go back, renegotiate or, or cancel my contract. And so there's, that always happens a little bit, but now we're seeing it at this kind of, there's this misequilibrium going on right now. But what's gonna happen as sellers start to get more accustomed to values coming down? What are sellers gonna start to do? Discount. Yeah, they're gonna readjust their mindset around value and, their, and things like interest rates going up are gonna kinda help them get there. But we're gonna be seeing some fantastic deals coming out here. When it comes to flipping uh, in a declining market, I wanna really focus on four key things that you need to do. And I hope you guys take notes because this is the formula I'm following to continue flipping in a down market. First of all, as I'm getting really choosy about the type of properties that I wanna fix and flip. During this past up market, it really didn't matter. Just get a house, who cares where it's at, what it's at, what kind of floor plan, any of that stuff, there's gonna be a buyer for it. And there's two things when it comes to what I call an A property. It's gotta be in the right location and it's gotta have the right features. Everybody understands location, but what does features mean? When I say features, what does that mean? Yeah, so floor plan, what else? Bedroom. Bedrooms, bathrooms, garage, basement. It, it, it's market specific, so whatever your market wants, whatever buyers want the most of, that's where you wanna be. You do not wanna be trying to flip a property that does not have the right features. So for example, I do a lot of flipping in Metro Detroit. In Metro Detroit, you wanna have a garage, you wanna have a basement, you wanna be three bedrooms instead of two bedrooms. So those features really matter. And so when a buyer has options, guess what properties they're gonna buy? The best properties on the market, which means you wanna be one of those. So I'm getting more picky about that. I'm staying away from things like two bedrooms, no basement. Or like if you're in Phoenix, maybe you stay away from no pool or things that are gonna maybe disqualify your property from a lot of buyers. Second thing is your ARV. I'm gonna spend a, a lot of time right now on ARV, after repair value. What is ARV? What does that mean, after repair value? The amount, the amount of property's worth after rehab. Yes, it's the potential future value of the property assuming that you renovate it to market standards. That's ARV. Well, in the past, traditionally, how do we determine ARV? We look at three key things. It's gotta be similar in features, the properties that we're gonna comp. It needs to be close in proximity in the same neighborhood and it needs to be recently sold. And that's how we traditionally comp properties. And usually you're safe doing that because the best indicator of, 
of future behavior is past behavior. So if we can find a trend of value looking at renovated homes that happened in the same neighborhood, similar to your subject property, you can with some level of certainty determine the value, the future value. But that's no longer the case, and I'm so glad that Jamil mentioned that. You cannot just go off of historical data right now, and it's not an accurate indicator of future value. But we want to establish a baseline, so we're going to look at solds to establish a baseline. I'm only going back right now three months, and even that, I'm really careful about what I'm looking at. Jamil talked about something that had a value of 500, but it sold for 625 or 650, and that $150,000 difference was emotional value, not real value. And so those are things we want to kind of pay attention to when we're looking at solds. But I like to establish a baseline. I like to say, okay, I understand now what solds have done historically, but what I really want to be looking at here to compare is the actives. Now, why actives? I mean, they're not sold yet, so it's not data, but what, is, what are actives telling us? Yeah, what the market's doing right this minute. So we want to look at how many actives. Is my neighborhood flooded with actives? Are there a lot of renovated homes sitting on the market? And how long are they sitting on the market? So I'm looking at days on market. How many days has that renovated home been sitting there at that price? Then I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. I'm going to look at the sold data that I created a baseline for, and I'm going to compare that against the actives that are sitting on the market and then I'm gonna adjust my ARV. Now there's no real science to this, but we're gonna adjust accordingly. I'll give you an example to help illustrate this. This is a house I bought recently in St. Louis, Missouri. When I looked at the solds, I only went back three months, I made sure it was relevant comps, and I made sure that they were recent. So I only looked at three months of data. And I found five fix and flip comps that sold. So these were sold comps, I found five. Renovated nice, flippers, and on average, they sold at 150 bucks a square foot. So I averaged out all five comps, 150 bucks a square foot. Then I looked at actives, and actives scared the crap out of me. Why? 10 active comps on the market, 10 fixed up renovated homes on the market, which means if I were to come on market at that very minute with mine, there'd be 11. I'd be competing with 10 other fix and flips on the market and they were listed at an average price of 150 bucks a square foot. Who sees a problem? What's the problem if that's the only data you have? What would be your analysis? The new value is not 150 bucks a foot, is it? No. Now those flippers are, what are they doing right now at 150 bucks a foot? They're going, well, yesterday's house is sold for 150 bucks a foot. My house should sell for 150 bucks a foot. If those 10 comps want to get sold, what are they going to have to start doing? Dropping price. So what would you call, and the average day was 60 days on the market. So that neighborhood was getting flooded. It has a lot of inventory, right? There's not buyers there gobbling those things up like there was three months ago or six months ago. So what would you do if that were your case? Well, if you had to adjust, if you wanted to buy a house with this data to fix and flip, what would you do? Where would you want to buy at? Yeah, I actually went 135 and I said, okay, I'm going to go with an ARV of 135 per foot. As, a, as an adjusted ARV. If I wanted to be even more conservative, I could go 130 a foot. So it's looking at all the data, but it's making now a wise, deci a, a wise decision based on current active data. Um, I didn't put this on my slides, but how valuable are pendings? Super valuable, because that's happening right this minute. Now when we see pending comps, we don't know what the contract price is, do we? No, but we know what the list price was, we know what the days on market was, and one tactic I'll do if I really want to try to understand that pending, like if I want that value bad, I want that comp bad, I'll call up the agent and I'll say, hey, I know you can't really disclose to me the contract price, but are we kind of like in the ballpark or are we kind of close, not close? And just try to get an idea of what that property went under contract for to help me get more data. Okay, it's all about data. I like to take the art out of flipping and try to make it more of a science. It's not totally a science because there's a lot of objection to flipping. But as much of that process I can to make it scientific, the better. I mean, the one thing we know about fix and flip that's different than wholesaling is the minute you take down a property and you take title, what happens to your risk? Inherently, it goes up. Whenever you own property, your risk goes up. Right now, you're borrowing money or you're using your own money. So there's risk involved. I want to try to minimize that risk as much as possible. And I'll, I'll share with you more around that mindset in a second. OK, the third thing that we're going to do differently flipping right now is we're, we've got to do bigger rehabs. We've got to do nicer rehabs. We've got to budget 
for doing full-blown rehabs, which is how we've always done it. That's traditional fix and flip. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna fix everything. I'm gonna make it a beautiful house, best house in the market. That was kind of the mindset we had before. What happened during this last two year boom? We were doing just the worst fix and flips, lipstick on a pig, right? I mean, I'm painting these old nasty cabinets. I just paint them, buyer won't care, right? And they didn't care. Just because of the demand was so high, you didn't have to do a big rehab. In fact, one of my most successful strategies these past two years has been wholetailing. Anybody wholetail? What's wholetailing? Anybody heard that concept? What is that? No rehab whatsoever, as long as it can pass a mortgage inspection, then you buy it and relist it. You still take it down and relist it and make $50,000 more. Why? Why could you do that strategy? Why was that an effective strategy? Yeah, it used to be if this is fix and flip up here and this is wholesale down here, there was this wide range between the two. So there was a lot of room to do a value add. What happened to that distance between distress and retail during the last boom? Shorter and shorter and shorter. Anybody see houses selling at ARV? Craziest thing ever. You're like, this house needs a full rehab and it's trading at almost ARV. Wow. So when we were buying houses that were dated, we called them clean, and clean but dated or mortgageable, that's not a real word, but we would call mortgageable, it could get a mortgage, then oftentimes the best strategy was to wholesale it to a retail buyer, not an investor. Super effective strategy. Not so much right now. That's not gonna be a really powerful technique, why? Because we're creating that disparity again between distress and retail because buyers have choices. When a buyer has a choice, they're gonna pick a brand new kitchen versus a paint, old painted kitchen, aren't they? Yeah, so now when we look at rehabs, we're going back to the old days, traditional fix and flip, which is I gotta try to be the best house on the market. My goal is when a buyer walks in my property retail, they walk in and they go, wow, I've looked at 10 houses and this is the best house. I gotta buy this house and I'm gonna pay full price because I gotta have this house, it's super awesome. So we're looking at staging and including appliances and all those things that are gonna help you sell your house. Okay, number four is, back to my main point of all of this, is buying right. Now, I kept this formula all through the last up because I just fundamentally always wanna make sure I build in the right profit margin on my deals. And all that meant was I got even more upside. But buying right is the key to fix and flip. You make all your money when you buy. What does that mean? Who's heard that before? You make your money when you buy. What does that even mean? No, you don't. You make your money when you finally sell it and you get the check. But what does that mean you make your money when you buy? If you buy lower, then you increase your amount of margin that you can make when you sell. Yeah, what it means to me is it means I could totally screw this all up. I could blow it. I could blow my rehab. I could blow my ARV and still make money. That's what that means to me because I bought at a deep enough discount. So the 70% formula tells us that we're going to take 30% right off the top. We're going to figure out ARV. We're going to adjust it like I showed. So we have a, we have a conservative ARV. Then we're gonna pull 30% off the top, 9% goes to closing and commissions, 6% goes to carrying costs. What's carrying costs? Financing, cost of yeah, cost of money. And 6% on a, off of ARV pretty much is 100% finance. And then 15% is your desired profit. Now of these three things that you're gonna factor in that you pull right off the top of your numbers, wh which one is really the only one that, that you can play with? Profit, profit. that's right. Because it. Closing costs are closing costs, commissions are commissions, financing for the most part is financing. Maybe you can play with those, the nine and the six a little bit, or you could sell fun maybe. But really, when you adjust the formula out of 70%, where are you taking that extra percentage from? Your profit. Your profit. Yeah, now people have gotten away with it, right? There are a lot of flippers that should have been out of business a long time ago that are still here today flipping, why? Because the market's been very forgiving, overly forgiving, meaning, just because I've owned the property for four months, now it's worth 50 grand more. <laughs> but did they win from using sound business practices? Yeah, we're gonna go back to sound business practices. Who's ready to go back to sound business practices? Yeah, we gotta follow fundamentals if you wanna survive in a declining market. You do not have the upswing to save your ass. You've got to get back to the basics. 70% formula is that way. We're gonna take that 30% off the top, means we're buying at 70% of the ARV. We're gonna subtract out our repairs, which is budgeting for a legit, real rehab. 
and then that's our buy price. And by the way, if you're a wholesaler in here, everything I'm talking about today is super relevant to you, super applies to you, why? Because the best wholesalers understand their buyers. So the more you understand the way a fix and flipper like Jerry thinks, then the better you're gonna be at wholesaling because you're gonna know the way that they're looking at the market, the way they're looking at deals, and you're gonna be able to bring them deals that match what they're doing and thinking. The best wholesalers I know understand their cash buyers very well. And if you need a deal analyzer, you can get mine, I'll give it to you for free. Just go to mydealanalyzer.com. It's a, it's a digital calculator that'll help you run all the numbers. Let me give you an example here of this. I gave, a, I gave a really big example when I first started, but this is a deal I recently did that I got caught in a, in a market correction a little bit, basically screwed up the deal. I went into the deal with a 400 ARV, which means at the 70% formula, I should have made a $60,000 profit on the flip, right? Because that's 15% of 400,000. So my projected desired profit was 60,000. Here's what actually happened. I was off on ARV, sold it for 385, and I went over on my rehab 15,000. Anybody done that? I've done thousands of rehabs, and this was a recent deal. Look at Jerry, he hasn't figured out how to do his business yet. And I made $30,000 instead of $60,000. Anybody sad for me? No. No, you're still not sad for me? But what's the lesson here? What's the lesson here? What's your takeaway? You bought smart enough to mess up. Yeah, I built in the screw up factor. Yeah. I built in some screw up factor. If I screw up the deal, I still wanna make money. Now I'm gonna cry about making 30 instead of 60 for about five minutes and then I'll move on and do another deal, right? But this is my philosophy with fix and flip. If I screw up, I still make money. Who wants to screw up and still make money? Isn't that awesome? What a business where you can screw things up and make money. Isn't that awesome? Here's my plan and I'll, I'll wrap up with, these, with, with a few of these ideas here. Here's my plan right now in the declining market. I'm gonna make more money. I'm gonna make more money in this declining market. Why am I gonna make more money? Two reasons. I've always made more money. I mean, just from when I started 20 years ago to today, I keep making more money every year. And it doesn't matter what the market's doing. Making money in real estate is not about the market. What's it about? It's your mindset. In fact, I'm gonna do a tiny little tangent here. Where I make the most money in my real estate business is, anybody know? Luxury. Luxury. Guess what's the, th the thing I talk about the least in training and on my YouTube channel and with people? Luxury. Luxury. Why? Why do you think that is? Unattainable. Everyone thinks it's so unattainable. Like that deal I talked about, I probably won't produce any content around that. My least viewed videos are when I show how I make a million dollars on a luxury flip. Nobody cares. Why? Yeah, but what's the reality? By the way, it took me 15 years to get this reality, but what's the reality with luxury versus low income or regular medium priced homes? What's the reality? It's a mindset. Some, it's mindset and some more zeros, that's true. There are some more zeros involved, right? That is true, but it's a mindset. That's it, it's just a mindset. In fact, my luxury flips are less work than my regular flips, less work. Why? Why would that be? Oh my gosh, I, can hi I hire the best contractors. We put in the best stuff. There is no keeping the toilet seat. We don't do that luxury. We don't keep the toilet seat. When you're flipping a $150,000 house, you dang are, you're thinking, man, let's keep that toilet seat. You gotta save some money here. You don't do that luxury. But my point with that is just flipping houses is not about the market. It's about the mindset. So I plan on making more money in this market and the reason why I'm able to do that is because I'm just quick to adapt. And that's, I hope, a lesson you take away today, listen to everybody talking here, is to adapt quickly to the market. Are you thinking differently based on what the market's giving you? And that's what successful real estate investors do. They adapt quickly. Not only do they adapt quickly, but they thrive in that environment. They thrive. It's human nature for us to not want change. It doesn't feel good, it's scary, we don't know. What we wanna do is we wanna get a strategy that works and then it always works. Like, man, I figured this one thing out, I want it to work forever. And so we basically are on the Titanic hanging on while it sinks when we do that. Here's what happens differently. When you go to look at the market, when you go to look at deals, when you go to look at opportunities tomorrow, you take the blinders off. I hope everybody takes their freaking blinders off we get so stuck in this one way of thinking about things. 
I want you to remove the blinders and look for opportunities. What is your market giving you right now? Where are the best opportunities? When one door closes, another one opens. What is that other door opening? And how can you capitalize on that? And I don't look at myself as a wholesaler. I don't look at myself as a rehabber or a builder or a landlord or an agent. I, am, I do all of those things, but that's not how I identify. I don't identify as any of those things. I identify as a deal maker, an opportunist, a market specialist, a flipping genius. Thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah.